boom, the other person says thank you. And then the strokey stands up, puts her clothes back on, and that's it. High five. <laughs> it's not necessarily a high five kind of vibe. Hey, lovebirds. Today, we're going to be a little bit more playful as we dive into orgasmic meditation. What the heck is this practice? Why it's important and how it could lead to a more connected relationship with your sensuality and your pleasure, and also how it can help you feel more connected to a partner. My guest is Emily Guimont. She is a orgasmic meditation coach. She's the founder of the Desire Institute here in Montreal. And she helps people feel more connected to their sexual bodies. That is work that I can get behind. Emily shares with us her story of basically having a really disappointing sex life and also having really painful sexual experiences early on, which led her to trying pretty much anything to turn that around and to start enjoying sex again. And it's a beautiful story. I'm super happy to share it with you. My name is Sean Galanos, and this is The Love Drive. Okay, I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Emily guimont belanger and I live in Montreal, and I teach about orgasmic meditation and the art of sex. Amazing. Can you uh, tell me what the heck is orgasmic meditation? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a real good question. It's a, it's a, it's a partnered practice. So it's a practice you do with someone else. So during 15 minutes, the person, which can be someone of any gender, strokes the upper left hand quadrant of a woman's clitoris. And during that practice of 15 minutes, the only goal is to feel sensations for both people in their body. That sounds very simple. It is very simple. It's a structured practice. So it has steps that are always the same. So it is even, I want to say, simple for the people who practice it. Uh, it is not necessarily an easy practice because having that much presence, attention, and awareness to how we're feeling in connection with someone else is, I want to say, the whole challenge of this. What brought you to orgasmic meditation and to doing the work that you are doing now? Mm, yes. I had a terrible sex life. <laughs> I want to say for the uh, first 10 years of my life and I want to terrible is probably like a really awful way to like say it but it, it was it was my experience that so much more was possible and I just did not know how to have access to it so I was feeling very like my body felt very like I want to say contracted like I could not feel a whole lot I could not necessarily know what I wanted either um, even though I had absolutely wonderful partners and lovers that were really sweet, but I just felt like I just did not know how to unlock that thing inside of my body, inside of myself. Like it felt, it felt like uh, very constraining. I could not have access to having an orgasm. I actually did not even know what that would feel like. And so I was feeling like, oh my God, like what's wrong with me? Like, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? Or what is the thing that is going to like open it all up at some point? And, and I was looking for that. So I tried a lot of different things. I tried the, the Kegel exercises. I read so many books. I, you know, watched too many, um, you know, TED talks and things that was like, what, what is the answer? Like, what is the thing that's going to have it be that I'm going to have a sex life that I feel super enthusiastic about? Like so many of my friends were talking to me like, oh my God, the sex with that guy was amazing. And I, I could not relate really. I was like, how did they have access to that? And I can't like, what, what the fuck, you know? So by the time I was like 25 or 26, I pretty much gave up. I, I saw a doctor and I was like, and the doctor had diagnosed me with something that's called vulvodynia mm -hmm. which is a chronic pain during intercourse and so the doctor uh, prescribed me this cream and she says so use this cream and then you won't feel anything you'll be able to have intercourse and it won't be painful perfect <laughs> i can't think of something more pleasant than being completely numb 
And I was like, no, like, this is insane. Like, this is not how I want my sex life to be. Like, that's awful. I just felt like I had hit bottom. Like, I cried so much after that medical appointment because I was like, I've tried everything and I just don't know what is going to what is going to change or what's going to make it change. So I gave up really um, having better sex. I just kind of thought that maybe it was just not going to work for me. And then eventually I saw this TED talk about orgasmic meditation. And one of the very important thing that the founder, Nicole Dedon, was the founder of One Taste. And, you know, she very much built up this whole practice to be known to the world with, with other people. And one of the things that she was saying was that with this practice, the idea of a woman being frigid or anorgasmic was falling off the window and it would be replaced by an entire journey of discovering what her body felt like and what her pleasure felt like. Mm. And then I was like, that's what I want. Like, I don't want to be feeling like I'm broken and I need to be fixed because I don't find any fix anywhere anyways. But I, I'm absolutely down for a journey of discovering, like, what does my body want? And what does my body feel like? And, like, what would that look like if this pleasure was going to start to, like, open up? Amazing. I, uh, I want to highlight how important I think it is for people to explore their sexuality in a narrative that is non-traditional. Yeah. And this is this feels non-traditional, right? Because it's not just uh, make out oral sex, penetration, man climaxes, woman doesn't, sex is over. Right? This is a practice that uh, is geared towards creating awareness and increasing sensitivity in how you feel sensations. Exactly, exactly. Um, in how we feel sensation and in how we can have more of that like vulnerability and opening and, you know, just like what I, I mean, what that felt like for me at the beginning to just lay down there and like open my legs and have someone like go and stroke my clitoris was very intense. You know, it was a very intense experience to have that much attention on to how I was feeling because my entire attention when I was having sex was how is my partner feeling and yeah. like, when is he going to climax and how can I best fake this so that it's the most pleasurable experience for him. Right. And I was having that so much so that I was very much disconnected from my, my own body, and my own experience. And so I had to recreate that connection and really like get to learn about myself. I can imagine that this practice it might bring more presence and awareness to the sensations in the receiver's body, which is, for the most part, I think is is women or people with with vulvas, uh, and but then also from for the stroker as well. Is that it's called the stroker, right? Yeah, exactly. the giver. Yeah, yeah, the stroker and the strokey. And it is a good question, also, that people sometimes wonder, like, what's in it for the person who's stroking because they're not receiving the the touch on their body, right? Like it can be obvious that the strokey, the woman receiving the the strokes is going to feel a lot of sensation in her body. And really what we're doing here is we are creating a container in which because both people are, are focusing all their attention on feeling, um, they will, with practice and experience, be able to experience the same sensations together at the same time. So that there is no separation, I want to say, between their two bodies, but that there is more and more connection. So when you're stroking, you can actually feel like, oh, there is this electricity in my lower back or there is this warmth in my chest. So you can know also in a certain way the kind of experience she's also having. So it's meant to bring, one of the benefits is that it can bring more connection between the people that are practicing exactly. orgasmic meditation, mm -hmm. also known as oming. Yes, also known as oming. It's our little way to like call it. Hey, would you like to om? Yeah. And, and can you just ask people if they want to om? Um, well, <laughs> I certainly have. Um, and it is recommended that people have uh, a, a, I want to say basics, like a basics training as to what is this practice. And it can be found online for free on the Institute of OM. Okay. So people can know what the, I want to say, what the steps of the practice are so that when they say yes to this experience, they know what they're stepping into. Maybe it would behoove us to talk about those steps. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let, let's like just break, let's break it down. Like what is oming from like sort of start to finish so that people who are listening have a really good idea of what it is that we're talking about. Oh yeah, totally. Okay, great. So 
Uh, the the first step is, in my experience, the most important one, which is that OM is a uh, is a desire based practice. It begins with the desire to have this practice. It's like I feel like, oh, this is the practice I really want to have, and then there's this person I'd love to have it with. So that's where it starts, and then after that, it's asking for that desire. Would you, and then asking someone, would you like to OM? Would you like to have an OM? And then this person is either going to say yes or no. Okay. Oh, when I meant the steps, I meant like the steps of orgasmic meditation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, we're going there. We are. Okay. <laughs> you were just giving me <laughs> you were giving me space to respond. Yeah. Um, and also because this is this can be a very powerful tool to uh transforming our relationship to our desires in the rest of life. So if in this practice we can have the vulnerability and the courage to ask someone for this practice, we can also find the vulnerability and courage to ask for other desires in our life. Mm. So this is one of the things that it allows us to practice in that first step. It's like when I go to the cuddle parties and I practice asking for certain types of touch. Yeah, very similar to that. And also uh, practice getting people saying no. Yeah, exactly. The experience of receiving a yes and receiving a no and um, still having gratitude for the person for simply answering and being there to receive your request. Mm, cool. Mm -hmm. So there's always a, a way that we say thank you, whether the person says yes or no. Yeah, I usually say thanks for letting me know. Yeah, that's great. That's great. But it is a way to let the person experience like, oh, thank you for receiving my request. And then I appreciate your answer, whether it's a yes or a no. Right. Mm. Yeah. It, which can be hard for people to do. Yeah. And I've received a lot of no's, particularly at the beginning of my practice, mostly because people were like, I want to say like at the very beginning of the Montreal OM community, I was talking about orgasmic meditation to a lot of people. And there was a lot of people who were like, oh, actually, no, that's not my thing. Like, I'm not necessarily interested in that. And I was feeling so sad inside my heart because I was so wanting to find partners to have this practice with. But it was a very, very good practice for me to like feel the rightness of this thing that I really wanted and how how much I wanted it and to keep going, no matter what the responses were. It was a very, I want to say very profound experience, profound training that I'm grateful I had. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I used to give, or I still do give free love advice. And oftentimes when it's nice out, I'll go out with one of these signs and I'll sit out in public and I'll just wait for people to come and sit with, with me. And before I used to solicit it more, I would be like, hey, do you want some free love advice? And people were like, no, mm -hmm. thank you, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And it can be incredibly challenging to just be told no over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you believe in the thing that you're offering or asking for, it sort of makes it a little bit easier to keep going. And once you get that first yes, things, things tend to like turn around a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Because then your brain knows that it is possible. Um, but before that, it's just kind of like working with the belief mm. that it is possible. So, but now we have a thriving community of home practitioners in Montreal. It's been, it's been almost five years that I do this practice now. So things are very different now and asking for homes is, I want to say a lot easier, but uh, I, I just get to enjoy. <laughs> You get to enjoy. Like I get to enjoy the fact that there's so many people that are trained in this practice now. The beginnings were much more like, you know, getting something started. So that's really where it starts. And it is sometimes challenging to ask someone for, for this practice because it is vulnerable. Yeah. But um, once they, they, they agree, they will set a time, say like on Thursday at 5 p.m. at my place or at your place. People will like organize the logistics right. of where that's going to happen. Which is, this might interest uh, your listeners particularly, because this is like the the feminine and masculine here acting in the ways of like feeling a desire, wanting something, and then making it happen, right. which would be more the masculine portion of it. Right. So we start with that particular dynamic before even we started the practice of um Cool. <laughs> um, great. So then you're interested in the steps. And so people will lay a nest. So that's a, a yoga mat, a blanket, pillows, a zafu cushion, a meditation yeah. cushion. Yeah. Um, and so they lay a particular space for the practice because we want to separate, separate it from, um, we want to separate it from sex. Like right. it, it is a, 
a practice of um, of connection of sensations of that is feeling based and is intimate, but it is not sex. Like okay. that's super important to just make sure that that is very clear. So that's one of the reasons why we set up a different space for this practice. That's not a bedroom or the bed. I mean, it could be in the bedroom on the floor yeah. if you have space. If you live in that, like when I lived in New York, when I did the the coaching program with One Taste, um, like sometimes we had to own on our beds just because we did not have the space right. with the very tiny right. New York apartments. So, I mean, it is possible. It's not recommended. If it's your only option, then... It's better than not owning. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to practice, like don't let the space, um, you know, make you not have it, if that makes sense. But it would be better if it's on the floor. And so once they set up the nest, then uh, the woman's going to undress from the waist down. And so that's really the only portion of clothing that will be taken off during this practice. Yeah. Um, no it's need. To... Still a big portion of the clothing. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But only the necessary to be able right. to have access to her genitals. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he remains fully clothed. And so then they will get into position. And so she's going to lie down and he's going to sit in the meditation cushion. There's a particular way to place their legs so that it's comfortable for both people. And the first step is going to be um, a limbic connection between the both people where the stroker is going to say, I'm going to touch your thighs. And he's going to say that and then put his uh, hands on her thighs. Mm. Um, and so one of the reasons why in this practice we always do what we call a safe port. We say what we're going to do before we do it is in such a way that the Strokey's Vigilance Center can really relax. Like there is no surprising touch or things that are happening that she's not expecting. So she can really begin to fully, fully relax and feel landed and feel like incredibly safe knowing what's happening. Even though she knows the practice, she even when he's doing it, he's like letting her know. So there can be like a deeper presence and opening yeah How can landing, we say it? landing landing i think yeah, it's sad exactly <laughs> <laughs> and so there that's the first limbic connection between their two bodies it's really the first moment where their bodies are connecting and they're feeling starting to like really bring their awareness to the feelings and sensations in their bodies and after that he's going to do it he the stroker could be a person of any yeah. gender really but the, pers the person who's a stroker will do a description of her genitals and like one or two sentences. Oh. Just like I'm noticing that um, your outer labias have a dark purple color and your inner labias are uh, light pink and folded on the right side, for oh, example. Cool. What's the purpose of that? <laughs> it's interesting. I want to highly recommend people have the experience of it in order to like feel in their body what that brings up for them. For me, the first time that I had someone describe my genitals in that way, I started crying. Mm. Um, for the, for no one has really had taken the, the exquisite attention to look at my genitals before. And obviously they had been like, you know, obviously I had had sex and I had had them touched and kissed, like all sorts of, all, all sorts of attention on them, but not looked at and described in a, in a neutral way. Yeah. So it's also not about saying like, oh, they're beautiful or they look like a flower. Right. So like whatever. It's, it's also like very descriptive. It's like, this is how your genitals look like right now. And then from this practice, I also realized that it changes. It's really interesting because most people will say something like, yeah, yeah, like, oh, your pussy's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Or it smells amazing or it tastes amazing. But it's it's rarely ever, like, give it sort of the descriptive attention that you're talking about. Yeah. And I don't think necessarily these qualities are not an, a good thing to say or something that someone could appreciate uh, to hear. But in this practice, we're uh, aiming at being able to have a certain neutrality so something that's a bit more like objective and what we see mm. and there it's a, it's a it's a very important concept in the buddhist tradition to be with what is and this is what we're doing here we're being with what is yeah we're not trying to change the experience no we're not trying to let it know that it's compares to something else that it's better or worse than anything else we're just being with like what's what is what is happening and so that takes off a lot of the chatter a lot of the beliefs or a lot of the thoughts that we might have about women's genitals mm. yeah does he does he think it's beautiful does he like it it's like okay he's just describing it yeah exactly exactly 
Okay, so I've described your genitals. <laughs> Um, and so after the noticing, we call it the noticing step, uh, he's going to put on gloves and lube, lubricant on the uh, right thumb and the left index finger and start a timer. 15 minutes. 15 minutes with a 13 minute bell. And I'll explain to you why. And then he's going to do the second safe port, which is to tell her, I'm going to touch your genitals now before he does it so that she can know what's, what's coming in. Do they say genitals or pussy? Um, I be to be really honest, we use different terms. You can say I'm gonna touch your pussy, I'm gonna touch your genitals, I'm gonna touch um in French there's a lot of different ways to say it also. Ta vulve? Uh yeah, or je vais toucher ton sex. Okay. Je vais toucher um ta chat. People okay. use it as well. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's I mean it's it it, it really comes down to I wanna say people's preference. The only reason I'm bringing it up is because I, I read that like One Taste, which is sort of the organization that, uh, what is it, uh, popularized? Yeah, this, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. this, um, this practice. This is their trademark, like orgasmic meditation is their trademark. It's their trademark. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of their, I, I, I was just reading up on how one of their tenets or something was that you call it a pussy. You know, we have for a few years. Uh, when I was trained, we would say, I'm going to touch your pussy. And then people would be like, you know, because there's more charge around that world, around that word. And, uh, you know, I know that Mama Gina has her book called Pussy. And there's like a whole reclamation around this term, yeah. which is absolutely wonderful. And I really love. Um, and with orgasmic meditation becoming more mainstream, now we use more genitals, mm. which is a little bit more accessible for everyone without that kind of um, slight discomfort people might have with the term pussy. But yeah. I, and the reason why <laughs> they called it, like they wanted you to call it pussy is because it was charged mm -hmm. and it would bring like a, a specific type of energy to the practice. It brings a certain kind of electricity to it. Yeah. It's like, ooh. Exciting. Yeah. Oh my God. Pussy. <laughs> <laughs> now there's pussy being touched. Yeah, exactly. So uh, pussy has been safe ported before. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're really starting this moment of stroking. So the strokes is going to be with the left index finger uh, with a motion that is up, down, up, down, up, down on the one o'clock spot of the of the clitoris. So if it was a, a clock, it would be on the upper left hand quadrant. And that is where we focus our attention for the for the entire practice, really, with the stroke that's about three to five millimeters long. 11 o'clock? No, we had this before. <laughs> <laughs> if I look at a clock and I look at the top left, I see 11 o'clock. 10 to 11. <laughs> but I can't remember how we figured it out. That I it was, know. Oh, it was because of the position. It's because of the position. Because the stroker uh, is sitting to the left of, or to the, to the person's right. Yeah, exactly. He's sitting on her right. Um, and so it will be my upper left, actually, from my own body's perspective. One o'clock. One o'clock. Okay. Yeah. There... <laughs> and yeah, I remember what I said to you after, because then you were like arguing and he actually, I'm going to tell you guys this. He pulled a paper and then he was trying to like mansplain me how I was wrong. <laughs> and I, this is my works practice. I've been doing this before. He's like, no, it's the 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut all this out, obviously. <laughs> Um, but so really that the, the clitoris has 10 different spots of, um, sensations that are incredibly different. And so, uh, when you learn how to really aim your attention and focus on stroking only like one spot at a time, then you can really realize how, um, I want to say the depth of variety of sensations that are available on the clitoris. And so when you, you with this practice, really learn to like focus on one spot at a time, then there is like a lot more that's available than just thinking that the clitoris is like a one sensation spot that you just kind of rob. Yeah. That brings uh, this, like you said, an, uh, a kind of depth that I am totally not familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know, like usually it's like, you know, I've just rubbed the clit and around the clit, but never got to the level of granularity of having, you know, being being aware of 10 different spots mm -hmm. and how they might all feel different. 
Yeah, absolutely. And which is why it's so interesting to have a practice for this. Because we're basically removing all the other stuff or are we having sex or like what's coming next or whatever. We have clarity around like a practice where we're actually experiencing this. And for strokers at the beginning of their practice, often it will be, I want to say, one of the realizations that it will make. It's like, oh, my God, I can stroke so lightly and so with the short that's so stroke and there's so much sensation. And it is a revelation for a lot of them. It is a revelation for a lot of women as well. Mm -hmm. who will either be numb at the beginning and be like, I can't feel anything. That's insane. And then eventually will develop more and more sensibility. It was, it was like that for me. Now, this thing that, that's coming up for me right now is that I, you know, I did an interview with Solomon Kruger about cuddle parties and I got a bunch of messages from women that were saying sort of like, Hey, uh, I think these, these parties are probably just an opportunity for some creepy dudes to catch a feel or to cop a feel, you know? And now I'm just thinking of, you know, we're talking about this practice that uh, most people have never done, that I have never done. And I have like some experience in exploring like a non-traditional. And you have lived in San Francisco. And I lived in San Francisco. Yeah, I don't have any reason for not have explored this before, <laughs> other than the fact that I was sort of under the impression that One Taste was a bit of a cult. And we can talk about that, just not right now. How do you find partners? I, I just imagine that there are there are women out there that this sounds great to them, but going from where they are to finding a partner that they don't know to taking their pants off and to being vulnerable with sort of a stranger, maybe, that seems incredibly challenging and sort of like a big gap. Yeah, because definitely you should not go about it this way. This practice really is for people to have this practice with. I need to know, I need to know the person, like them and trust them. So this is not just about finding anyone out there in the world and like, let's, let's try this. So there needs to be like solid trust between the two people and clarity around the fact that we are agreeing to this particular practice so that when the timer goes off at 15 minutes like he does remove his hands take off his gloves and like the practice is done you know what i mean so there the 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 the, pe the person who's also stroker needs to uphold the container of the practice right. both people uphold the container but both people need to agree to that yeah there definitely needs to be a connection there because okay, it's so a connection based practice so i mean i have definitely gone to um like new york and owned with a lot of people that i did not necessarily know personally but also because it was my level of comfort that i knew they were trained and they were part of the same community and i was feeling comfortable with that but when i started i definitely needed to like go for coffee with the person get to know them and then we'd set up a time for the practice after i felt like this is this is a good this is a person I want to have this experience with. And I think that is fairly common of any new activity in a new community. When you're new to it, you're going to be a little bit more hesitant. You're going to like take more time to get to know people. Mm -hmm. And then when you've been in it for a while, like if you are going to a bunch of sex parties, after a while, yeah, you get in there, you rip your clothes off, <laughs> and you've got a better idea of you know, the, the types of people that are there and you, you have a better instinct on who you want to connect with. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why there's a community for this. Like we have, we have groups of people who are practitioners of orgasmic meditation that are connected together, or, you know, really in any cities where this practice is, is alive and active. How do we find them? Oh, well, um, there is a, there is a, well, people can contact me directly to be added to the Montreal home community. If they yeah. live anywhere else in the world, um, there are communities like in so many places in the United States. I mean, I, I guess you could find them on Facebook. You could find them online. You would type in like orgasmic meditation in the name of your city. Well, that's a good question because I'm actually wondering how other places work now that there's no more in-person courses. There's only the practice that's taught online. Right. Right. So yeah. how do we find, how do we find, I don't know. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, mean, we'll... I, I know from Montreal. <laughs> yeah. If you, just come to Montreal just and you'll be, Montreal. Yeah, you'll be set up. <laughs> I will do some research. We will do some research okay, and yeah. I will, uh, I will figure it because out. Because they're fairly, they also, the, you know, the idea also is that it's a very close groups for practitioners, but there needs to be like an entry point sure. for each city. Yeah. Yeah. Like, a. A cinq a set or a yeah. cocktail happy hour. Yeah. We do brunch actually every month. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah brunch. Yeah. 
that's sort of like the the BDSM kink community has a munch, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a sort of a potluck. I also don't know. I'm not um I'm not well versed in that community mm-hmm. either. Okay, so we will we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure out the entry point for <laughs> how to get into this practice. So I did a little bit of digging around and your best bet is meetup.com, which is funny because that's what I recommend people to go on when they are looking for people to meet either in dating contexts or for new activity partners. So it turns out meetup.com has the best selection of groups that are doing orgasmic meditation events and or Tantra stuff. And I know those are two different, but sometimes they kind of get clumped together. So according to this list, which is uh, in these show notes. So if you go to your podcast app and you look at the show notes, there's going to be a link for the meetup.com orgasmic meditation sub genre. The cities and areas with the largest orgasmic meditation groups are Denver, Boston, um, Sydney, Melbourne, Paris, Silicon Valley, LA and Berlin, and then Montreal. Those are the top 10. But there's more. There's actually 39 groups. So that's your best bet. Also, typing in orgasmic meditation plus your city or your state or your country in your search engine of choice might also bring up some results. It'll also bring up like all of the negative press that One Taste has ever gotten about the fact that it's like kind of a cult and they they were sort of a high-pressured sales organization. All that stuff comes up as well. So if you're curious about orgasmic meditation, that's going to give you a whole lot of info. We are continuing our conversation with Emily Guimont about orgasmic meditation and the art of sex. We didn't really get to what happens at 13 minutes or like... Which is a question everybody's wondering about yeah, yeah, by yeah. this time. Yeah. I mean, we stopped at sort of the 10... There's the 10 spots. Mm -hmm. Uh, You told me that I mansplained you. I agree. I'm sorry. Uh, I had the perspective wrong. You know, there's like (laughs) skiers left and then like mountain left or something. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. Or like, uh, what is it in theater? Stage left and Mm -hmm. and audience left. Yeah. So anyways, fucked up. My bad. Oh, that's all right. I appreciate. I appreciate you for apologizing. (laughs) Uh, so where are we now? Yeah. Now we're stroking. We're Great. still stroking. The, we are the, stroking the, the time, the upper left. left hand quadrant. Exactly. And there is adjustments in communication that can be happening during the ohm. So oh. the person receiving the strokes can be like, oh, would you give me a, a lighter stroke? Or can I have a stroke a bit more to the left? Or would you give me more pressure? You know, so the adjustments is given in a way that makes him win, makes the stroker win, mm. you know, so he, so the person would know what, what to do differently, right? And so uh, the stroker is only going to say thank you when there's an adjustment and they can also uh, make uh, offers, be like, would you like a, a bit more lube or would you like me to go a bit higher? Then the, the stroke, he can simply say yes or no. So very simple communication during the practice, but there is communication that can be possible. We don't necessarily expect both people to like, there's a connection between the thing and the clit and like all is magical and it's the highest point of sensation. Like it's have, you know, it's like, it's, it's like sensations are flowing. Like it can be, it's possible to like make adjustments to get there. Yeah. And always, like, it's a good thing to make adjustments in general and learning how to do that is just a really great tool for, um, also applying that skill in sex eventually being able to like ask for what we want and being able to make adjustments so back into the ohm uh at 13 minutes what's going to happen is we're going to begin to bring the experience down so there's going to be downstrokes and downstrokes i'll I'll show you visually um but it's when the finger actually goes a bit like with a bit more pressure and a bit slower with motion towards down in a position to upstroke upstrokes which are going to be lighter upper feeling mm. right i'm getting a great visual guy <laughs> she's using her, her hand with but, my hand yeah her hand 
<laughs> but I'm getting a great visual. It's hard. That would be really hard to explain. It's but a little bit hard to explain, but um, the I, em- the emphasis is on the down, yeah. whereas uh, during the first part of the practice, the emphasis is sort of on the up. Exactly. Exactly. Very much so. So now we're going to begin to like bring it down and heavier and. There's this feeling of exhale and like a heaviness in the body for the last two minutes to just like really bring it down. And after the 15 minute mark, then the stroker is going to remove their gloves and the two people are going to sit up and they're going to say one moment, something that he felt during the practice. So there was a moment I felt a light opening uh, in my chest, Mm. for example, or there was a moment where I felt like my eyes were coming out of my head Mm. you know anything like that that's again neutral it's not like it was amazing or it was sensation like we don't want to be general or we don't want to lose it into abstraction we actually just really want to say like there was a moment i felt electricity at the tip of my finger boom yeah done boom exactly the other person says thank you and then they're going to wrap up the nest the strokey stands up puts her clothes back on and that's it high five It's not necessarily a high five kind of vibe, but you can. <laughs> it might be more of a hugging kind of vibe. Yeah, just like, hey, thank you. And then like both people go to work or both people go home to like make dinner or they just yeah. go about their life. Right. Really. Okay. Wow. And orgasm, uh, sorry, climax is not the goal. Climax is not the goal, though it might happen, but it's not like we're definitely in a goalless practice. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing that we want to make happen or that we want to produce happening. Uh, both people really surrender to feeling sensations in their body during this practice and having their full conscious like presence and awareness to that only. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And I keep hearing about this thing called sort of the difference between a climax and an orgasm mm-hmm. state and oming is designed to bring women to an orgasm state. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So we have such a, I want to say, generalized idea that climax uh, is like this rising of sensation that has this one explosion of intensity and then there's like some sort of the coming down. Mm. But that'd be fair to say it's traditionally a bit more body based and like on the masculine mm-hmm. side. Uh, yeah, it's goal oriented and it's also very limiting. Yeah, that's what I want to say. It's kind of like this, this, um, this idea that it should happen in a certain way. And so when we come to a practice like orgasmic meditation, we're going to be a lot more present with the peaks of sensations that are rising up and down, up and down. And that is what we are going to want to feel. We're not aiming to like go up, 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 up until there's one moment of explosion. We're actually really riding the wave because there's like there's an up and there is a down yeah. and the up will feel more expanding, light, buzzing and like and almost like almost like your body is expanding towards the sky. And the down is going to be feeling a bit more like heavy, earthy, um, grounded. You know, that kind of feeling. And then there's a peak that's going to go back up and then down and up and down. And that is, I want to say, the curve that we're we're wanting to uh, develop and being more conscious in during this particular practice. Yeah, I I sort of seeing you not want to use the word contracting because... Yeah, because that's not what it, it is. It doesn't sound like that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Sort of an expansion and then sort of a, he- a like a heaviness. Yeah, like an up and a down. And then it's like... Whoa. It's like we need to inhale and then we need to exhale. Yeah. It's just like in just like in our breath that our, our bodies, our orgasm does that as well. And most of the sexuality is so concentrated on the up, on the intensity of like rising, um, that we are learning here to really have it come down and being present on that down. Which is what gives up gives us power for more peaks to come, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking now I'm thinking of the experience of the stroker throughout all of these ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any experience. So I don't know, can you speak on some of your past partners experiences with this practice? 
when I'm a stroker, for example, um, I'll be able to feel when there's a lot of electricity that's going on. And I'll also be able to feel if um, there is more like lightness or heaviness. And one of the art of being, of being a stroker is you're not like producing something to happen, is you're actually surrendering to the sensations that are arising. And you're learning how to how to be in resonance with that. You're learning how to be in resonance with something that exists that you're not controlling either. I'm I like I'm so curious. I so want to do this. I uh yeah, I'm looking forward to to my intro into this practice. Yeah, absolutely. I did a or I did a, a energetic sexuality workshop recently. And and we talked a lot about this concept of sexual energy, and it's not really anything that I had ever thought that much of. Like it was actually kind of foreign to me. And throughout the workshop, you know, it was really meant to help people get in touch with their sexual energy and to uh, cultivate it and to welcome it and to sort of make it grow. And for me, it was really really subtle, but that's because. I, I'm not conditioned to think about it that way. And I think that with more practice, it would, it would, I would become more sensitive to noticing the presence of this energy. And I'm assuming that this practice also does that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And because I think we're so focused on what is happening in terms of like, what are we like, how are we touching and, or who's doing what and the actual mechanics of sex? Like we're so focused on, what's happening that we forget that sex is the language of sex is actually feeling like the, the underlying language of what's really happening is in the felt senses of like what we're experiencing. And the reason why we all want to have sex is for intimacy, but also to feel the sensations in our body, not just to follow through a script. Right. So to be able to have a practice that focus our attention at cultivating that growing our capacity to feel uh, in high, you know, in heightened states of like sensation is very valuable. I just wonder what the hell I've been doing my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a little disappointed in myself. Well, the good news is it exists now. It is out there. It is available. It is possible. So let's just enjoy that. And I'm not too old to get oh, to get course. started. You know, I have owned with people that were much older than me. Mm -hmm. And some people that were just realizing this later on in life and were like, oh, my God, this thing is actually available and possible and started to develop that and just enjoy it. So wherever we are at in life, it's always a it's always a useful tool. And so also for people who are differently abled, then there is different positions that are possible to use to still have access to this practice. Okay. So people who are in wheelchair, for example, can or women who are pregnant can still have the practice of home just with a different position. So it's it's it is accessible. It is accessible. That's the point exactly. Really, all you need is the the finger, the clitoris, the willingness to go there. Okay, the finger, the clitoris, and the willingness to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a bumper sticker for for <laughs> orgasmic meditation. It is the most powerful tool that I know so far. You know, to uh, experience expansion in the capacity to have a better sex life. How is your vulvodynia now? Oh my God, pain has completely removed. It's true. I, I did not, I completely, there was a point where I completely stopped having pain, any source of pain, and it was fully replaced by pleasurable experiences. Yeah. I mean, that's a ringing endorsement right there if I've ever heard. I that. mean, from my own experience, like I'm not a doctor, I can't like prescribe this thing, but I will say that bringing more consciousness in the body is a very powerful tool to address any form of pain you know, uh, you know, any kind of discomfort or like I work a lot with women who have experienced pain, experienced pain in sex. Um, it is a very common experience actually when I realized it and I was like, Oh my God, I was definitely not the only one out there. Yeah. I mean, they, they made a cream for you. I know. That's how popular. That's how <laughs> common. <laughs> that's how common this issue is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sadly, actually. I, uh, recently had a sexual experience with a person and uh, our goal was to just explore sensation together. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. And we were, we spent a lot of time sort of noticing what was happening with our energy mm -hmm. and it would come and it would go. And it wasn't that sort of, you know, that like 
toxic movie sex. You know, <laughs> toxic in a way. Like I'm just thinking of, gosh, what movie am I thinking of? Something a really bad with Richard Gere, but basically like a really intense sex scene where you're just like ripping your clothes mm-hmm. off where it's obvious there's a lot of sexual energy. And I mean, I always find those scenes like a little inaccessible for me. Like I'm not the type to just like uh, swipe everything off my desk and like take you right here, right mm-hmm, then. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And <clears throat> so we were, we just played a lot with, the presence and the absence of sexual energy with no goal other than to be aware of the energy that we're creating together. Mm -hmm. And it was a really beautiful practice. Mm -hmm. It was really completely different than the way I'm used to having sex. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's beautiful. It it really is about surrendering to this thing that we want, like surrendering to this thing that the bodies are calling for and whatever shape or form that really wants to take. It's going to be different every single time, and it's really different for everyone. So being able to uh, put yourself in that kind of space where it's like letting flow what wants to happen. Mm. It's so important because there's so much conditioning around how things are supposed to be. It's interesting how you can have really different levels of arousal Mm -hmm. and excitement and sensation with different people. Mm Mm-hmm. And just because there's less arousal doesn't mean that you can't still have an, a pleasurable time. Mm-hmm. But I still haven't figured out what it is that creates arousal. What would be your thoughts on it? Uh, there's a physical component, just like aesthetically pleasing. There's a compatibility component, but also that's a little misleading because if there is no, like if it's not compatible, sometimes that can be extremely erotic and arousing. And that's why I mentioned like toxic relationships sometimes can be really, really exciting Mm -hmm. because you just know this is not going to work and this is probably not what I need, but goddamn, does it feel good. (laughs) Yeah, it's something something that's inappropriate that we should not be doing or inappropriate. Yeah, maybe not like culturally inappropriate, but maybe like personally, your, personally, yeah, personally breaking this, your own rules. Totally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this seems sort of like an obvious question, but like, how has this changed your life? It changed my life in so many ways that I did not expect it to change it. If that makes sense. Well, obviously, I came. I came to orgasmic meditation because I could not have climax and sex. And that, that that for me was a huge problem in my life. And there, it had a lot of different impacts. One being that I found myself more connected to my body. So just to re- fully reconnect. And I, I want to stress this out that when I began orgasmic meditation, just to be able to bring my own attention inside of my own body and feel like it took me a while to be able to do that. Because I was so much in my head and just like pierce through like all the different layers to have access to that spot that had so much sensation. It was a lot. But eventually when I was able to feel there, it was like a whole world was opening, uh, which is where exactly I wanted openings to be happening. Uh, so I, I felt so much more connected to myself through my own body and to my desires in general. Like, who am I? What do I want? Like, what am I bringing into this world? All of a sudden, these became questions that before I was, you know, I'm an academic and I was having a great job and I was like doing things in the world that I thought were great. And I think they were. But eventually it was also a sense of purpose. Like, what do I want to contribute with these learnings that I have had? Mm. So uh, this is one of the reasons why now I teach about orgasmic meditation and the art of sex. And I work with so many women in that field to uh, support other people who are wanting to get on a similar journey. And when you, as a child, when they asked you what you wanted to be uh, when you grow up, it wasn't like, oh, I want to teach the art of sex and orgasmic (laughs) meditation. I wanted to be a doctor who would not prescribe those kind of creams. Now you're sort of like, you're sort of that. It's more of a, yeah. you're sort of a healer. Yeah, exactly. 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 In the most beautiful ways, because sex is such a powerful 
experience to be had. And so many people find themselves like stuck in different locations of like, oh, I've been with my partner for so many years and now we don't have as much electricity or I don't really like the sex I'm having or or like they, they have a lot of sex, a lot of climax, but don't necessarily experience the kind of connection and intimacy that they want to have. Like there's so many things that I that I observe and that I see when I connect with with people and bring them to the next level is definitely the thing that I'm most passionate about, how through the, this like personal development, they can have access to that more that is available and just tracing the route with them. And it sounds like not only are there benefits to being more in tune with your sexuality and what it is that you want, but you were able to translate that into what is it that I want out of this life? Absolutely. It it became like, I want to say a quest that was at that depth for me. Yes. And there is a spiritual teacher when I was in, um, when I was studying in San Francisco who said, Lynn Forrest, she said this thing to me, um, in your life, take the thing that has tortured you the most or that has been the most challenging and turn it into your purpose. And really these years of like wondering about sex and like feeling hopeless around it and not knowing what I was going to do and finally finding answers and having that experience for myself is definitely something that I think this world needs more of. Not everybody will like quit their job, move to New York and study orgasm <laughs> like I did, yeah. obviously, but I'm so grateful and happy for the opportunity to bring these knowledge back here in Montreal. Well, that's it. You did that work so that you can go and impact other people. Yeah, exactly. I did it for myself at first, to be really honest. Like when I took all these workshops, I had no intention. I was a social worker. I was working with um, homeless people in you know, municipal court of Montreal. And I was really happy there. And I, I just wanted to have a better sex life for myself. And then eventually I, I did achieve that. And then I went deeper and deeper and I just kept my studies of sexuality, intimacy and connection. And that became a, the world that I actually want to bathe in now. I'm glad you, I'm glad you took those, those steps. Yeah, me too. And I'm just thinking of that Lynn, Lynn Forrest, uh, what she told you, you know, and, and, and sort of applying that to my own life. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that's tortured me the most has been my love life and my quest for emotional intimacy. And, and, and here I am giving love advice to the park. Yeah. And having this podcast. Yeah. You're doing it. Yeah. Yes. Eight years single. <laughs> There's some girlfriends here and there. But. You know, the beauty, though, is it never stops. The work we're teaching and the work we're doing, even for myself, I still know that there is more to a better sex life. Like there is more that I can learn. And I am I keep on learning. Like I'm still a student of this art. Um, and hopefully I will always be really. Uh, I'm just a couple steps ahead and I can, you know, walk people through what I've been going through already. Yeah. You have the experience mm -hmm. and you have some frameworks. Yeah. I was talking to a client yesterday and I was coaching, coaching them. And the last thing we left on me saying, sometimes loving yourself means letting go of people who don't love you. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that I needed to hear. Mm. Oh my God. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's beautiful. Yeah. And sad. Yeah. And sad. It's an interesting dynamic I find in coaching that what I coach people on very often resonates with my own story in some sort of ways, not necessarily the same circumstances, not necessarily the same facts or like the same environment, but that there is something that is going on for them that I can relate to. And it, it it's, um, it's a healing in both ways in a certain way. It's, I mean, what, what other, I mean, there are some other lines of work, but very few. In very each. few will actually give you as much as what you give. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that we would be doing a disservice? Like, obviously we could just go on <laughs> if, I mean, we, like, if we go into the art of sex, like that's, that's a series of podcasts, but, uh, and apart from where we can find you and the mm -hmm. work that you're doing, is there something that we are are missing when it comes to orgasmic meditation. I think that's it. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's so much more. <laughs> like, no, is it for something that I have studied for the last five years? I can tell that this is just the the surface and the iceberg of like what's possible. I would say try the experience for yourself, and the experience tells so much more than 
anything that I could be talking about. And this is what I invite people to do is to try it. And if they have any questions or need any resources, I'm sure that they can find, you know, communities and, and you know, people that have experience in this practice around them. If you're in Montreal... Yes, contact me. <laughs> if you're in Montreal, to be honest, if you're anywhere in Canada, I know where all the communities are because we're all connected. Um, but if you're in Montreal and you're interested to know more about OM, we have this very vibrant community that you can join. And if you are interested not to learn necessarily the practice of orgasmic meditation, because I... You know, in my experience, I've also come across a lot of people who are like, I love the content, I love the philosophy, but I would never try it. Mm. And that's totally fine. Like, I just want to say, like, it is a very edgy thing to want to experience or try, and it's not for everyone. And that's totally fine. The The reason why I love teaching about the art of sex so much is because I, what I did is I took the the content, the philosophy, the principles of this orgasm state, of this focus and attention on sensations in the body, of this, uh, I want to say, this idea of having a more fulfilled life. And that is something that I teach for people to use directly in their sex life. Skipping the step of, of having the practice of OM, but still having a lot of the benefits from its principles. So you have, you have clients that, like, they want the benefits and they want the content and they want the awareness, but they don't want to do the practice. Oh, yes. Well, I want to say a lot of people who go see like sex therapists, for example, want to have a better sex life, but they might not be willing to like lay down with their legs wide open, having someone stroke their clitoris for 15 minutes. Right. right. But there is something that they want. And th that desire is definitely valuable and, you know, can be can be worked on, can be answered in different ways. Right. And you can explore yeah. with them yeah. different ways of bringing that sort of awareness or that yeah. sort of sensibility. Exactly. There is so much that's available and like there's so much that's possible. And OM really, or the practice of orgasmic meditation just kind of happens to be one of the tools that I use in my work for people who want to have a more fulfilling sex life. Where can we find you? Uh, so the Desire Institute is the organization that is um, dedicated to promoting the art of sex. So you can find me at the Desire Institute. And just very simply on Facebook, you can also message me if you have any questions or are interested to work with me. I have in-person work and I also have some online work for people who might not be in Montreal. Amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, final question. Mm -hmm. What is love to you? Love is... Um, it's expanding into generosity i think of who we are through other people whoa i'm always blown away by people's answers they're always so different mm -hmm. expanding into generosity through other people is mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>